So my job is to just introduce the series to us. So we're looking at Esther. For about eight weeks, we're going to try and look at Esther. And so what we're going to do now, I'm going to give you the background to get us up to date so we are in the right, right part of the Bible. And then um, John's going to come up and he's got a particular message coming off the back of the introduction. And then we're going to do a, a bit of a drama to finish us off. So that's the plan <laughs> to finish us off. <laughs> so in the beginning, it's a very long background story. Now, in the beginning, God created the earth, and it was a good world, and he appointed mankind to be initially a gardener, but they were to continue the creation that God had started. He gave them an authority to do that, but man rebelled and chose to go their own way, and so they got um, kicked out of the, the garden. But we see there the whole falling apart of what God had designed as good. So. We see then things like the flood happening and God starting again. And then if we, we, instead of looking at mankind from a kind of macro scale, we zoom in to a particular man called Abraham. And God's going to start with him to start rebuilding the good world. That, that was the plan. And so Abraham had Isaac, and then after Isaac we had Jacob. And then Jacob has his 12 sons which are known as the, Jacob's also called Israel. And so this is where we get the nation of Israel. They came out of Jacob's 12 sons. Now, God's trying to demonstrate through his relationship with this people group how he wants to relate to the whole world as part of his mission to reclaim the world. Now, we know that these guys end up going over to Egypt because there's a famine, and then we start in the book of Exodus, and we see these people have now been taken captive and are made slaves in Egypt. So the next person that we see risen up is a guy called Moses. Moses is called to lead these people out of Egypt. And so we get the story of um, the dividing of the Red Sea. And they, they weren't a pleasant people still, but God was still very faithful to them. And so we take him, he takes them out of Egypt into the wilderness and then from the wilderness into the Promised Land. Now, once they get established in the promised land, we see that there's, um, there's some good kings that start. We have, we have uh, David and Solomon. This was like the heyday of Israel. This is where they're in the, their best possible position. But it doesn't last for very long because after, um, after Solomon, his son and another guy called Rehoboam end up splitting the kingdom. And it splits into the northern tribes, which are called Israel, and the southern tribes, which are called Judah. And that's the story all the way through Kings. Now, God is continually rescuing these people throughout all of this time. But it comes to a point where they've continued to rebel against God. So then God chooses to give them over to, to the oppressors. And so we see the fall of the two kingdoms at different points during their history. So the first kingdom, Israel, falls to the Assyrians in 722 BC, and Judah falls to the Babylonians in 597 BC. And so a lot of these people are taken into exile into these uh, various kingdoms and kind of spread across the place. Now... The kingdom of, of Babylon is taken over by the Persians. A guy called Cyrus conquers them in 539 BC. And he inherits all of the Jews that have been dispersed into the kingdom. And it's Cyrus that starts the, the process of allowing some of those people to return to their homeland. And so we see the story of Zerubbabel and Ezra being sent back. And they begin to rebuild the temple. And then the story of Nehemiah, who returns to build the wall. So we pick up the story of Esther in about 483 BC, which is during the reign of a king called Xerxes. He was the fourth king of the Persian Empire. And so that at this point, the empire stretches right across from India, right down to a place called Kush in Egypt, up to Greece over there. It was the largest empire the world had ever seen at this, at this point. 
And so there's still many Jews still inside Persia. And that's where we get to the beginning of the Esther story. Sorry, there's one bit I forgot to say, which was the, um, it's not clicking. Okay. Um, so this is some of the things that we're going to be looking at. So today we're going to be looking at um, what it's like to be homesick, and that's what Dad's going to be picking up, what, what it's like living as exiles. Next week we're going to have a little look about how God works in silence, and that's a theme going through the book of, of Esther. And we want to consider that. So how do we partner with that God? How do we partner with a God that's working in the silence? And so we're going to look at um, how, God, um, how we're improved by input, how God prepares us through God's gym, how we can um, be positioned and, um, and see what God's doing, how there's a hindrance to our ability to work in partnership, which is a focus on beauty and uh, pride, we're going to look at what helps, which is kind of season the day, that sense of faith. And then we're going to look at a concept of the violence of grace. It's all about what he's done. So there's, we're going to jump around the book of Esther because we're going to be focused on these themes. Good. Thank you, Jamie. I, I, I like to be able to see you. I just didn't feel I could quite get to it there. You know what Mark was just asking? about did you hear anything good? I heard something good. But it was for all of us. And I couldn't work it out. Sometimes you can't when God speaks. He said, I've set aside time for you. I thought, hmm. An appointment in the diary? And he said the next bit. Yeah, I've set aside time for you. 24-7, every moment of the day. And he said, in every moment, not just the good moments, but in every moment, my love remains completely the same. It is without limitation towards you. I felt that was kind of quite like hearing that, just a reminder. Okay, so, Esther and... Co are in exile. Uh, anybody ever been homesick? Yes. Huh? It's a horrible feeling. It's a, I don't quite know how you how you really explain it. Um, Dawn was, felt homesick once. I think it was when we got married. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> when we when we gone off to the states and uh, to California initially uh, with the family, uh, so I mean it wasn't without the family. It certainly wasn't without me, which you would think would be sufficient. And we'd heard it was warm and sunny, and it just rained for three weeks, and then there was an earthquake, uh, and she'd not experienced that before. It's strange. It's not. You can't really explain it. There's a sense of something's not quite as it should be. And I think what we're looking at here is the possibility of a just that something's not quite as it should be. And this theme as James just shown us, carries right through the Bible. Uh, even Jesus, of course, was in exile in Egypt. Um, just, uh, just not nice. Horrible time. Um, and, of course, the early church was persecuted and ended up being in exiles 
across a, a wide region of places. And that's how the gospel was spread. I wonder what it must have been like. I think it kind of helps us to understand. Yeah, I think that, that picture's a good picture. Um, can you see it all right? If you look at the faces of those children, you know, it's something uncomfortable. You know, we were thinking um, next weekend, next Saturday, Prince and Mary and the family arrive. For Prince, he's been here before, but for Mary, all the differences, all the changes. Um, yes, different language, different culture different values and this sort of sense of homesickness. But as a people in exile, I think there's something in us that can really feel and experience that. We're living somewhere <coughs> that isn't whole. I'm not talking about discontent with you know, the fact that we live in glorious good maze or uh, delightable dagnum or whatever but something deeper than that something that doesn't quite fit something that is an alternative to what we're designed for clearly the the mess that we see in this world as almost as weeks go by it, it, you think what else can they come up with you know I'm talking about leaders of nations and things like that. Obviously, in addition to that, there's all the pain and the suffering and destruction. It certainly wasn't God's intent for our home. This clearly is a world that's not as it should be. But we discovered and were en route for a world of God's design. It's like there's something in us that causes us to not fit exactly in what we see in this world. We are exiles. We'd like to save all, but at the same time recognise that we can't or we don't really fit in. Let's just think why we're in that situation. You see, we have submitted our lives to a different king, to a different authority, who tells us that we should stay uh, and recognise and obey the leaders in the land. But there are values, there are principles which... They are principles that we see and we see the value of because we've, we've got a new revelation, a new understanding because we've come into a new kingdom. When we made Jesus Lord, when we took him as our Lord King, we came into a different kingdom, vastly different to the world that's around about us. Therefore, we can agree with the writer to the Hebrews for, in Hebrews 13, verse 14, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we're looking for a city that is to come. Again, in Hebrews 11, for he was looking forward to a city without foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Or Philippians 3, 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now, there's a key. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, we've got our British or whatever nationality passports and citizenships and things like that. But over and above that, from the moment we said yes to the Lordship of Jesus and gave our lives over to him, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await, this is Philippians 3, we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's something 
that, that's set into our being. You might call it a memory trace. I like Ecclesiastes 3.11. He's made everything in his appropriate time. He has also set eternity in our heart. Guys, like it or not, we ain't never going to fit uh, easily into this world because we are citizens of a different king. Something has been birthed in us. And we feel that and we, we, we have that sense of what it is to be kind of exiles living here. <clears throat> of course it brings us back to the thing that we come back so often. It's almost like one of our foundational scriptures in Psalm 84. How blessed is the man, his strength is in you, whose heart in whose heart are the highways designed, set their heart on pilgrimage. We've been called to that, and so much more. You know, if we're awake, we're, we're, we know we're not truly home. We, we are like exiles. And the best this world can offer, it, frankly, isn't enough. So what's home like? Well, we get tasters of it. We had a taster of it this morning, the presence of God. The opportunity to commune with God, to hear God, to be able to speak to him. Expressions of worship which are, are not restricted and not just following some formula. Freedom from, from pain, from sin, from death. A love that's released, I think that's possibly the biggest thing. Something which is inexplicable. It's experienced. You can't teach somebody. You can't explain to somebody. It has to be experienced. God's love uh, reaching into our hearts and changing our lives. And home, that's home. That's, that's, that's beginning to get again focused into what it's really like. So that we can talk about the whole world being filled with his glory. It's our home. This is where we're heading. Reflecting him, whether it's in operations of righteousness or kindness, an influence in the places that God enables us and allows us to be. So we've got this kind of discontent, this kind of homesickness. What do we do with that? Well, I'm going to suggest there's three things that we can do. We can bide our time until we can escape. We want to be the first out when the bell rings. Be out me when the um, bell went, the first one out. You start packing everything away about two minutes before the bell. Put everything back in my pencil case, really, really discreetly. <laughs> Put it back in my bag. There you go. But still pretend I've got a pen, an imaginary pen, because they can't see because someone sat in front, so you pretend you're writing. <laughs> put, your, put your coat on really discreetly. We can sing songs. Not here for long. We'll soon be leaving this old world of sin and woe. Up above the clouds we'll go. I mean, would you believe it? That, that was the focus that I was brought up under. It's a focus of how soon can we get out of here? That's one of the ways, and there's a lot of people who are focused like that, one of the ways in which we can deal with the homesickness. It's called focusing on escape rather than engaging. Or we can 
give up on the dreams that we've got. Yeah, it's never going to be any different. It's, it's just how it is and just got to kind of soldier on somehow. Or we can give ourselves up for this world. Deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him who gave himself for the world. Of course, that opens a doorway to a powerful, impactful influence, demonstration, example of this other kingdom when we're given over to him in that way. I believe God calls us because he's a God of restoration. He calls us to engage. He calls us to impact, not to escape. In Jeremiah 29, which we've often visited in verse 4, when he sends a prophet to correct this wrong doctrine that everybody got taken up with. And by the way, we live in a world of wrong doctrines that everybody can get taken up with, but it doesn't make them right. And to correct the thing about, you'll soon be out of here. And he said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. You're here for the long term, basically. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters and increase in number. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prosper, you too will prosper. You see, that's, that's the truth. That's the doctrine that we follow. That's why we're excited about Valentine's Park. Not just because it's a park, because this is a demonstration... Not Valens, Valentine's, Valens, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, because it's a demonstration of what God would do, even in the physical situation and landscape. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, instruction to people like us, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Further than Valence, we were having a little tally up the other day of some of the funding that in recent times, I'm not talking about contracts of the past, I'm talking recent times, that we've managed to, in the goodness of God, bring into the borough for the good of what's happening here and the demonstration of what God is like and the fulfilment of this word. There was a man called Aristides. And he was sent by the emperor... Emperor Hadrian to spy out what was happening these sort of strange Christians he was sent through the empire uh, to find out and he came back having seen them in action and he came back with a mixed report but there was something that he said that has echoed right down through the ages immortal words that he spoke to the emperor he said I'll tell you one thing Behold how they love one another. You see, this is the instruction that we know we have to follow. That's why community, that's why shared life, that's why expressing love one to another is so important. John 13, verse 35. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Also, the Bible talks about being salt in the earth, light in the darkness and salt in the earth. 
Well, the only value of salt is if it actually brings a distinctive taste that is different to what else is around it. If it's done for, if it's got spoilt, then it's just some white, grainy dust. So there should be a distinctive. There should be a difference. We're people of a different kingdom. We're here in the purpose of God. But we're here also as part of that purpose to demonstrate what he's like and part and the most important part of that is the way we love and especially loving one another. We're not really talking about, yeah, we're counterculture, but I'm not talking about superficial difference. I'm talking about substantial difference. There were some children that I heard of once that used to play a game in the car called as we drove uh, as the person drove along <laughs> spot the christian <laughs> it was not only the method of driving but you know of course in, there were times when real christians used to wear hats but this would be just superficial stuff uh, you know that kind of put down the people do. Want a fag, mate? No, thank you. I'm a Christian. <laughs> well, I'm not promoting smoking. It's bad for your health. <laughs> but that kind of put down stuff. I don't see any spiritual value in only wearing clothes when they're five years behind the fashion. I, I can't you know, doesn't, they don't become holy after five years. And I remember I used to sit in the meetings when this was the doctrine uh, those years ago. And I had hair then. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> and the, the pastor used to rile against modern hairstyles. Well, I didn't have short back and sides. You know, I, it was slightly modern. It wasn't quite Beatles. And I, and I thought, what is the significance of that? Listen, guys, God's not asking us to be different in a superficial kind of external way, but in who we are, what we do, how we treat people. We've got eyes because God has equipped us to see. Eyes for something beyond the present world and the present situation and system. Philippines 3.19 Their destiny is destruction. And God is their stomach, the glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. This is talking about those who really weren't following him. Mind set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I get a little bit concerned when I see a, a, a lack of contentment because our citizenship is not about... A man's life, the Bible says, doesn't consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. So in this time, we're not just going through... Uh, as we have done in series in the past, verse by verse, we are actually going to pick up particular themes from the story of Esther. And as we go through, uh, I believe that God has some very special things for us, not just to know, not just to learn as a kind of um, theoretical exercise, but so that we are equipped we're committed to pilgrimage as people of exile that have eternity in their hearts. And that there will be particular things of equipping and challenge as citizens of heaven. And I believe that there's a place that we can engage in this, which is quite simple. It would be saying, God, please... Open my eyes. Help me to see how I can engage and impact in this world. 
And we'll be looking at that as we go through the series because this is not just about head knowledge. This is about God equipping us in his purpose at this time. So Jamie's going to come and we're going to have a, a refresh. I know you've all read the book of Esther. You've all done your homework. You've all read it probably several times. But Jamie's going to help us. Okay, right. So we're going to try and get through 10 chapters of Esther in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, for that, I might need some help from some people. Um, so rather than going through the whole process of asking for volunteers, could you all reach under your seats? Because some of you have already been pre-selected to be characters. If you find an envelope, wave it in the air for me. Right up in the air. Okay, we've got one over there, one over there. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic, we got... Okay. Right, once you've got your envelope, now, if you've picked up an envelope and you are so desperate not to do it, you may be able to convince the person next to you to fall on the sword for you. All right, once you've got your envelope, come stand next to... Yeah. All right, so come, come stand over here. Okay, my glamorous assistant will get you guys dressed up and ready. Okay, now we'll find out if one of the envelopes is on a chair that no one's on once we call out that character and find they're not here. So, we have... Um, we just got to make the scene here a little bit. Oops. Sorry, Dan. So, we've got a... Temple, not temple, we've got a palace. Some cutbacks. Yeah, just open that one up for us. And we've got to have. Got to have the city gates. So we put those kind of over here. So it, just got to use your imagination a little bit, okay? Okay, so, at this point, the nation of Israel had been disobeying God, so God allowed the empires to, to conquer them, and so many Jews were sent as slaves over to this empire. Oh, there's no Mordecai. Someone must be... Someone check, check the seats next to you, because you've got lines under there as well that we need. Any spare seats? You can't remember where you put it. You should have done a grid reference. Okay, Josiah, come be Mordecai. Okay, right. So, he's not done anything yet. Don't give him a clap. Um, okay, Xerxes. Xerxes, come. So this is the king of the empire at this point in time. Here's your. Uh... There we go. We have King Xerxes. So, King Xerxes, come stand by your palace. The best you could do. You could never really have a very evil Welshman, could you? <laughs> okay, so he's the most powerful man in the world at this point in time. He's the head of the Persian Empire. So he has a banquet to show off all of his wealth. So let's have a little look what we've got in terms of his wealth. He invites all of his nobles to come to this big banquet and... And so it takes 180 days to show off all of his wealth. I mean, that, that's how loaded this guy was. Sorry, the wealth is coming. Just say, show me the money. It's coming. 
Well, that's why they're both the same name. No, no, that one's a winner. It's that one. That one. That one. Can you project it? Okay, so King Xerxes' wealth. This is what the people are spending. Uh, they're, they're feasting and enjoying all of this wealth. He's got bars of gold like this. He's got loads of US dollars. He's got a big house, five cars. He's even got the original packaging of Chewbacca. Okay? He always says yes when he's offered bags when he goes shopping. And worst of all, Mum, he doesn't even reclaim the pound out of his trolley. <laughs> so he, he has all this wealth going on. You can blank that down for us. And he wants to show something else as well. He wants to show off his queen, Queen Vashti. Okay? Now, the queen is over here. Chuck a crown on her head. Now, they've been feasting for 180 days. Wine was plentiful. So he got all of these drunken men from all over his empire, a little bit high. And so he says, bring me up my, my queen so I can parade her before all these drunken men. For some bizarre reason... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Say your line. Bring me my Queen Vashti so that she may parade herself in front of all these drunken men. <laughs> For some bizarre reason, Vashti says, Not on your Nelly. <laughs> okay. Now, that was either very brave or very stupid to take that position. So, the king decides to replace her. So, he sends his servants... <laughs> she, she's banished over to the side of the stage... And he, the king sends his servants throughout all the lands to find all of the young, beautiful, fair virgins. <laughs> Luck of the draw, eh? <laughs> Thankfully, he's been drinking for 180 days, so it might just work. <laughs> Now, Esther is an orphan, a Jewish orphan, and she was adopted by her older cousin, Mordecai. <laughs> so, we see that this, this relationship is very important, and we're going to pick up on that throughout the time. So, Mordecai, just take a step back for now. So Esther was collected along with loads of other women, and we can just project again, and they were effectively entered, <laughs> they were effectively entered into a beauty pageant. And so it was a big competition with all of these beautiful young virgins just like Esther here <laughs> taken in, into the palace. And they were put in the charge of Haggai. Yes, we do. Haggai, I don't know how to pronounce it. Haggai? Haggai. Okay. So this guy was in charge of looking after all these women, making sure that they've been... <laughs> Blush him up. Just a little bit. Just really, really good. On my nose, on my really nose, good. on my nose. Oh, yeah, we go. oh, the transformation is incredible. <laughs> So Mordecai had told Esther, keep your heritage a secret. Don't let anyone know that you're, you're Jewish. Okay. Now, when Haggai was instructing people like Esther, he said, 
think you are a model, you know what I mean, and you will do do your little turn on the catwalk, yeah, on the catwalk, on the catwalk, yeah. You'll shake your little touch on the catwalk. OK, Hagia, you can go stand back over there for me. You can blink that out. Now, out of all the women that went through the audition, Esther was by far King Xerxes' favourite. <laughs> and so, yes, so... In, so he takes the crown from Vashti oh, no. and puts it... On Esther. So Vashti's banished pretty much now. <laughs> it was a sm small part, small part. <laughs> now, Mordecai liked to keep a watch on Esther to, to make sure she was okay. And he worked by the city yeah, gates, <laughs> which is a place of significance. So he was kind of hanging out there, whilst two plotters... Happened to be talking, and they happened to say, I'm sick of serving Kix Ursis. It's time we assassinated him. I know, he doesn't even provide dental insurance for his employees. Let's kill him tonight. Okay, so Mordecai hears this, and he goes and tells Esther. <laughs> no, well, no, no, you're not on slow lines yet. That's later. <laughs> Sorry, you just take that information. Tell him. No, you, you, you go and sit over there now. This dude's gonna wipe you out. Okay, and Xerxes executes them. Okay. You should be wearing that. Um, now, meanwhile, there's a really nasty guy called Haman. You've got to have a black cape if you're a bad guy. So this guy is, on his, uh, is working his way up the career, his career ladder, um, and the king likes him so much, so just come over here a little bit, king, the king likes him so much that he, he's made him effectively the prime minister. So he's got his flip chart, Naomi, he's got his flip chart, not his flip chart, his whatever that is, clipboard. Okay, and... In a culture where people would automatically bow to people of higher office, you know that this guy must have been particularly nasty because the king had to make it a law that you had to bow to this guy. Okay? So they weren't naturally choosing to do it, so the king had to force people to do it. Now, one day he was walking past Mordecai, and Mordecai who was a man of integrity, didn't feel that honour was due to Haman, so wouldn't bow. <laughs> this got right up Haman's nose. And so he didn't want to just do away with, ha with Mordecai because he knew that Mordecai was a Jew. He wanted to do away with all of the Jews. So he came up with this plot... Am I at that point yet? So he set up a gallows in his garden. Yeah. 
Okay, so he set up a gallows. You're going to have to hold it there the whole time. Um, <laughs> with Mordecai in mind. Okay? Then he told the king, you can sit down there. Haman comes over to the king and says to him, Look, there's this rebellious people that, that won't honour you. Um, and I think there's a way of actually getting money out of these people. So I've got, I've got an idea for you. And so he opens up his little file of facts. And he presents a very important law. And so he convinces the king to sign it. Now, after that signed, the message is put out throughout the land that on a certain date, you're legally allowed to kill your Jewish neighbor. There will be no um, response to that. So you are free to do that and take their wealth and then tax some of that to the king. Now, they think this is such a good idea. They've signed the law. They've passed it all. They sit down and they have a drink. Meanwhile, the people of the Persian Empire are shocked. This was not on the cards at all. Now, Mordecai hears about this, and he, what is traditional in those cultures, he rips his clothes, and he pours ashes on his head. Which was a sign that he was in mourning. Now, Esther hears about him being in this state, and he's not allowed to come actually into, through the gates to the, to the palace because he's, he's not happy enough. Okay? So she's, this whole conversation happens through a messenger, so that's got to make it much harder, but I can't be bothered. So, <laughs> so Mordecai tells her, this law has just been passed, and you've got to do something about it. So he says, oh, you don't have your lines. And I don't have the lines anywhere else, do I? <laughs> yeah, so it's bad news. This law has been passed. Um, you've got to do something about it. Esther replies, What do you think I can do? <laughs> I'll survive just by keeping my mouth shut. And now you want me to speak? Let me see what your next line is so I can guess what it's like. Okay. The, Mordecai says, look, you're in a tricky position here because if you keep your heritage secret, if you pretend you're not a Jew, either two things will happen. One, someone's going to figure out that you are a Jew and you'll be done for it too. Or God will rise up someone else to rescue the Jews and once they know that you had the opportunity to do something and didn't do anything about it, they're going to come after you. So you're in a pretty tricky position here. And so she says, I will go into the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. <laughs> okay. So he hadn't Oops. summoned her for 30, 30 days at this point. Now, the king doesn't sleep alone. It meant that he was having visits from, uh, from his other wives or his concubine. So she's fallen out of favour. So if you approach the king without him having summoned you, you are throwing yourself on the mercy. You're, you're, you're rolling the dice. It's a risk. Because if he doesn't want to see you, you're, you're done for it. So the only way that you would know that the king has accepted you is if he points his scepter at you. So she enters into the palace and the king points his scepter at her. Okay. So he, he says to her, what do you want, even up to half the kingdom? Uh, I'll give it to you. Have you got any of these lines? Save my life. Okay, not yet. Oh, yes. Do your line. What can I do for you, my sweet? <laughs> <laughs> so Esther says, I want you to come to a feast that I'm doing. And so I want you and your um, 
your, your right-hand man, Haman, to, to come and, and eat with me. So they agree. And, and they come for a feast over here. Is that what we're up to? Yes, come for a feast. Where's Haman gone? Oh, Haman's there. Okay, so it's, it's, it, again, there's cutbacks. Okay, but, but come over here, and you've, you've got a little bit of wine as well going on. So Esther puts all this on. Yeah, 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 we're all going. <laughs> it's called Hovis. Okay, so they, they have this feast, and um, whilst they're there, the king says, So, what can I do for you, sugarly? <laughs> so the, Esther says what you can do for me is come to another feast tomorrow night the, the both of you come again okay so then they they, um, they go away now Haman is pretty chuffed with himself at this point He's thinking, wow, out of all the people in the kingdom, the king has honoured me. I'm I'm incredible. This is is working out well for me. Now, I'm sorry, I'm just catching up with myself. One second. That night, the king can't sleep. So he opens his book that is written for him when different things happen. He's got his dear diary. Now, in this book, he discovers, hey, remember those plotters that tried to kill me and that guy Mordecai saved my life? What what did we do for that guy? And it realises... We never did anything for him. I didn't write him a card, I didn't send him flowers, I didn't do anything to recognise him. And so he's thinking, what must I do? Now, at the exact same time, Haman, who's been walking the streets thinking, yeah, I'm the bee's knees right now, he sees Mordecai again, and he's thinking, oh, I can't stand this guy. Even though all these people honour me, this guy still won't do it. I'm going (laughs) to... I'm going to sort this guy out now. You can sit down again. So he comes to the palace to talk to the king because he's going to say to the king, there's this one man that we've got to take out. His name's Mordecai. Now, at the same time, the king's reading this book. There's one guy we've got to honour. His name's Mordecai. What are we going to do about it? So the king calls in um, Haman. I have a line. Did you have a line? I have a line. Go for it. Haman, what do you think should be done the man the king delights to honour. Now, obviously, if you think about Haman's frame of mind, who's he thinking the king's talking about? So he really hams it up. He's thinking, you know what? I need, I need, uh, I want to be dressed in the king's robe. I want to be uh, paraded around on the king's horse. And I want the highest official saying... This is what will be done for the man that the king delights to honour. So he, he, he tells the king that plan. The king says, bang, you're on it. That's why you're my, my right-hand man, because you always think of the excellent things. Now go and do that for Mordecai. <laughs> so, do we have a horse? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so Mordecai comes over here when we put the king's robes on him. Okay, climb on your horse. (laughs) Okay, and then Haman walks around parading. Do you have a line? This is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Okay, and Richard, you've got some lines? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, you can put them down now, save your back. Now, 
Haman is beginning to think, you know what, things are looking pretty bad now. I've already started this law in motion. I've already built the gallows for this guy. How can this guy now be executed by the law that I have set in place after the king has publicly praised him like he has? Just as he's thinking that, and he's talking to his family, and his family's saying, yeah, you're done for, the carriage arrives to take him to the next feast. So Mordecai, you just sit out there. Esther, you're preparing the feast again. Um, King Xerxes, Haman, come back to the feast for the second night. So, having a, a great time. Obviously, I can imagine Haman's mind's a little somewhere else at this point in time. <laughs> the king asks his question. So, what can I do for you, my honey bunny? <laughs> 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 and Esther replies, Save my life. Haman is trying to have me and all my people killed. I am a Jew. I am a Jew. <laughs> okay, now this is a, a real shock and it's an insult to the king. But at the same time, he realizes he signed that law. He's put it into motion, and he can't just stop it, because that wasn't the way that laws worked in the Persian Empire. So he steps out of the room, so furious, and thinking, I'm in a bit of a predicament here. At which point, Haman comes over to Esther and is begging her for his life. (laughs) The king happens to walk back in at this point. And this doesn't look very good. (laughs) First of all, no one can be in the presence of the queen without the king. And no one can be in the presence alone. And so Haman (laughs) is bagged up. At which point one of the servants says, you know what, there's a gallows already prepared that Haman was going to use for Mordecai in his own garden. Why let it go to waste? So Haman is taken and hung on the gallows that he had built himself. (laughs) Now, at this, this point, the king takes Haman's position and gives it to Mordecai. So he becomes Prime Minister, but we've still got the problem that this law is still in motion and it can't be retracted. So Esther and Mordecai work with the king and they come up with a new idea. So they sign a new law and that law is published, which says the Jews can defend themselves. They can fight back. It's legal for that. And so though there was some fighting, a lot of it, people didn't bother because they didn't want to get get into a a big fight about it. And so Esther had used her position to save all of the Jews. And that's the story of Esther. Well done, everyone. (laughs) 